Uh, before we begin, I would just like to thank everyone who were involved with the arrangements for this session, especially you, Kuleng, for initiating it. And then just for those of you who are not aware, the People Behind the Pro uh, Papers project was born in the Department of Psychology, I think in 2011. And the aim of the project is to unveil the personal journeys and the personal aspects of the people behind the publications and research work in the field. And that's usually done by um, means of a conversation that's uh, then video recorded and posted online. Now, if you want to view any of the previous conversation that's taken place, you can visit the www.peoplebehindpapers.co.za. Now, the project also relies on volunteers to produce the content, and um, therefore anyone is involved uh, uh, welcome to become involved. Now, if you're interested, you can also just check on the website. There's a link how to get involved, and if you click on that, it will give you the guidelines to the volunteers. Um, now, yes, today we are joined by Dr. Derek Cook, all the way from the UK. And without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Blair to, to start the interview. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leanna. Hey, good morning, Derek. Hello, Blair. <laughs> This has really been a long time coming. We've been trying to have this conversation for a while now, and uh, I'm happy that eventually we have this opportunity to be able to have this conversation. So the idea with this is to get to know you, get to know who Derek Hook is. I know from reading your work and um, just getting to know your, your thinking and about how you think about issues, um, it has also impacted in the work that I do as well. But I'd like us today to to go back a little bit and for you to take us on, on your journey, your life journey, and speak to us a little bit about where it all began for you. <coughs> okay. Um, Blake, thanks very much for inviting me. And thank you to everyone for um, having me. Um, I really, really um, appreciate the opportunity. Um, and it's, it's nice to be able to speak to colleagues. So yeah, thanks. Um, I suppose it's always difficult to know where to begin with these stories, but let's think of one point of origin which links very strongly to UNISA. And I suppose that would have to be somewhere along the um, history of things, not into Blanche really, because maybe, maybe 20 years ago, um, he was at Bits, which was of course the institution that I was at for a long, long time. And um, somewhere, something happened. This must have been about the mid-90s. And I don't think it was directly or obviously correlated to changes that were happening in the country, but there was some connection. Um, and what started to happen there was some enthusiasm for critical psychology. And um, what's so interesting about that is, if you'll forgive a really bad uh, analogy or metaphor, do you know that Wimpy, this is totally off the track, but anyway, so you know Wimpy, okay, the Wimpy bar, right? You know, it starts in England comes to South Africa, is a much bigger success in South Africa, and then South Africa is now the headquarters of Wimpy, which has bought and owns all the British Wimpies. <laughs> so that may sound like it's completely irrelevant, but in an odd sort of way, I kind of think that has almost happened, if not happened, in some ways with critical psychology. Because there was this, also this kind of exciting thing happening in, in British social psychology where they started thinking about critical psychology. There was a series of big names, uh, Erica Berman, kind of feminist critical psychology, her partner, Dan Parker. So they started publishing, like, I mean, I don't know how they published that really much, you know, and there's like three papers a month deconstructing this, deconstructing that. But there was some exciting thing about how to think differently about psychology. And different people had different views of what critical psychology was. For me, it was a way of thinking, in part, the psychology of power. And I suppose all of us here had to wonder why one would want to make a career out of psychology. And I mean, it's a, it's a pressing question also in South Africa today. Why, why would you, you know, go an academic route? You're going to be a counselor, you're going to be some kind of clinician. What are you going to be? Theoretician, doctor of psychology. But for me, at least, the, the, the lights went on, particularly around critical psychology and, and Michel Foucault. So for me, critical psychology was about the analysis of power and the multiple different vicissitudes of power moments of race, racialization, identity, ideology. It opened up a whole variety of things. So Martin was one of the people, I think, who was in contact with Ian Parker. Those guys came. We had some conferences. And why I was so heartened to talk to you about, hear about the student conferences that you guys organized was that Martin was also trying to do this thing. We had this series of qualitative methods conferences. Yeah. Um, I was a bit kind of junior in the ranks, as it were, so I think I missed out the first one. 
Um, and then there was, uh, we had a second, a third, a fourth. I think we culminated in one, the big one, I think it was maybe the second. There was one called Touch Me, I'm Sick, which is not really your traditional type of conference title. Um, oh, and then we had one called uh, Histories of the Present. And anyways, there was some goings on at one of these conferences, I think, if I remember, perhaps it's best not to allude to them here and all, but, but you know, we got this, oh, I don't know, I can't blame Martin for this, but anyways, we got some performance artists, and things were, let's just say, they went along the lines of un unfamiliar lines, according to traditional <laughs> academic conferences. But to, but to cut a long story short, those were extremely exciting events. One of the reasons was because they were trying to think about as it were, interesting qualitative methods, but they were also trying to think about critical forms of psychology. And also what I thought was so important about those conferences was they tried to involve students. They really, really tried to involve students wherever possible. And they had a kind of <coughs> exclusionary basis to get people invited, involved. So that for me was like a, a, a kind of a big thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then I suppose that for me also made it possible to think about what to do as a career in psychology um, the psychology of power, or uh, I suppose the big vogue of post-structuralism at the time. Um, but also not just possible as a career, almost vital, almost crucial. Because it felt like this was a kind of, we didn't, I don't think we had articulated it in those terms at the time, but this was a distinctively South African experience. So that kind of got the ball rolling, and then we managed a bunch of colleagues, we started trying to do some, some books, and um, you know, in these kinds of trajectories, these genealogies, it may sound a little bit fickle or silly to mention the publisher, but sometimes publishers help. And uh, we, we made a relationship with um, Solani Gubeni, um, who's had various ups and downs in his own publishing career. But anyways, he, um, he really helped facilitate some books for us. We did a developmental psychology book. Martin, I think, did a, a, a qualitative, even a quantitative methods book. And then, for me, in, in some respects, the real culmination of that was that the fairly large critical psychology book, which, as you were pointing out, is now 10 years old. Um, and in that book, a couple of interesting things happened. And, and I think one of my lessons in working on books like that, it's once you've just signed off on the proofs and the book goes off, and then you realize what your book actually could have been, what was really the the even better project. Mm. And part of what started to come to the forefront there was um, Solani, the publisher, and various contributors were, were proud of it because it was just called critical psychology. Mm. Typically, the, what one should supposedly do is say critical psychology in South Africa, whereas English or British or American publishers don't do that. They just right. say critical psychology yeah. as if they are entitled to speak for the whole field. So, you know, up until the last moment, I was happy if it said critical psychology in South Africa, but the argument was, was rightly made. And I think that opened up the prospect of saying what would be a distinctively South African critical psychology or a, a critical psychology which has learned lessons from the South African experience. So hence the wimpy thing. I, I think basically, and maybe it's true today, I don't know, I'd like to think so. But I think the most interesting and fascinating and vibrant kinds of critical psychology are no longer coming from Britain or even the United States. I, I think they can come right from here. So with that book and the relationship we had with Juta and UCT Press, there was the suggestion, hey, we don't have to use the global US textbooks anymore. We could start trying to write our own syllabus. And that was exciting. And, and some of the chapters in that book, I think, start to do that. But the reason I say that sometimes only when you finish the book that you realize where you could have gone was for me, the next step in that process, which has gone from uh, critical psychology, qualitative methods, Michel Foucault, power, was to start trying to look at um, Fanon and to look at um, post-colonial theory. I can't tell you how many times I remember going to the critical psychology events, particularly with Ian Parker, and, and they would say, well, you know, the theoretical resources of critical psychology, we need Marxism, we need feminism, we need psychoanalysis. Fair comment, but it just seemed to me there was this total blind spot. People weren't wanting to engage with post-colonial theory, which seemed to me vital here. So with that critical psychology book, there was some stuff on Fanon, which was interesting. But the kind of bizarre naivety was to write this whole chapter on Fanon, to have that stuff starting to open up, and only then realizing Actually, there's a whole intellectual tradition far closer to home. Why not do a whole book on Biko? And so by the time that book went off, I really started to think, well, we need to do that kind of stuff. 
Why, if we're able to start thinking about, you could call it vernacular psychology, or the available intellectual and critical resources in South Africa, why are we not engaging with black consciousness thought? So that book went off, it still does its work. I mean, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good book, but it, it started me thinking about that stuff. And I suppose that was the next step, really, to start thinking about what is, if you could call it, post-colonial um, theory in its relationship to psychology. And hence, the, the one book that I've got is, is called The Critical Psychology of the Post-Colonial. And it tries to say, we can do something different. We don't have to do the traditional job of saying, you know, Eric Erickson, uh, I don't know, Zimbardo, all of the traditional guys who have the white males who've created psychology in some yeah. respects. Yeah. We can look to a different set of resources. Um, and in, in some respects, Fanon became a big, big thing for me because it, it, it's so multi-layered. It's so philosophically driven and it's so vernacular, by which I mean he takes a whole series of sources, a little bit of psychoanalysis, touch of Marxism, a little bit of existential kind of theory, and he blends them to try and develop uh, a unique vision. So particularly Black Skin, White Masks, for me, is a book about psychology. It's a kind of book, I think, that should be on a reading list of um, a psychology course that is engaging with race, racism, all these kinds of things. And it's a rich resource, because you can go to it many, many times and find different kinds of things. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So what I'm hearing is that combination of uh, psychoanalysis and social psychology, which then makes me think about all these divisions that you normally find within psychology, where you have social psychology, you know, you. Uh, developmental psychology there, uh, therapeutic psychology there. And I think what you try to do in your work, from what I've seen, is bringing in the role that psychoanalysis plays, but then linking that to social psychology, which I think also Fanon in his work does as well, in terms of understanding the social realities, yes, yes. but then uh, drawing from psychoanalysis. So yeah, I'd be interested to know about your experience and what people think about this, because I think, I mean, you get other scholars, so Edward say the big guy, the post-colonial theorist, you know, he writes Orientalism. I mean, he's in literary, in, in a, he's a literary, or was a literary critic. And he writes all this stuff and he gets into trouble from the purest literary critics who say, well, you, you kind of do more politics now, what are you doing? And one of my biggest disappointments about living in the UK was um, going to a social psychology department. I mean, it was like a London. I don't get it. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, and to take it further, you don't understand the particular quality of colonial racism without the factor of desire, without the factor of sexuality, without the factor of some attraction. I'm like, hey man, racism is about hatred, surely. It's about exactly the opposite. But his argument is that that's part of it. And in fact, he would say, um, uh, Stuart Hall's got a very nice gloss on it, which has kind of made the thing fit for me. But he said, in a way, you need to understand that part of what is happening in racism, Fanon's argument, as retrieved and developed slightly by Stuart Hall, is that there's a kind of attraction to otherness. So the more a colonial sphere or the apartheid sphere wants to exaggerate difference and say, you guys are others, you guys have got nothing in common, the more, strangely enough, it creates the minimal and maybe partly unconscious question of, wow, that other is pretty fascinating. What is it about them? They're so different, they're so weird. So the more you otherize, the more you also create this kind of subterranean question about, wow, they're kind of exotic and interesting. So without spending a lot of time on Fanon, this is the one, one of the things that he says, and I, I just, it took a long time to get this. And he also comes up another example of generating new forms of theory, a new theoretical and conceptual tool to do critical work where that didn't exist. And one of his big contributions there is to talk about the gaze, the racial gaze, and how that even in looking, there's a kind of race construction of some sort going on. And of course, he, he describes it in very evocative terms. There's a famous scene in Black Skin, White Mask where he quotes this young, I think it's a little white girl on a train. Yeah. And she goes, Mommy, Mommy, a Negro, I'm afraid. And he describes this, this process of being looked at. Mm -hmm. And another thing which kind of blew my mind is he describes the process of being looked at as a, as a physically disabling, disruptive, destructive experience of being looked at from the place of the other. So there's multiple different ideas there. One is just the, the, the idea of the racial or racializing or racist gaze, the act of looking as a form of violence, but also the fact that in looking that there's sometimes an attraction that the raci racist or racializing subject cannot admit. And for Stuart Hall then, what happens is, he says racism comes up as a defense against a form of attraction which is then defended and repressed. 
Now, you may not want to go that route, okay? I often like speak to this with students and they look at me as if, what's the time? <laughs> yeah, you know? So you may not want to go that route, but it's, it's an interesting way to think about stuff. But the reason I mention it is twofold. One is because I think Fanon does do, he gives us new concepts, new modes of critique, new ways of thinking the world, which is what critical labor is all about. And it, it's vernacular, it happens between existing disciplines, by an overlap, by, by a bringing to the surface of a distinctive context, a distinctive political context to generate new stuff, rather than doing another 17th edition of an American textbook. But the other reason I bring it up is because McCrony, in like 35 or whatever, so my dates keep on shifting every time I mention his name, is saying a very similar thing. He says that part of what is happening in, you know, because this is now obviously before apartheid even begins, which is another amazing thing, right? This is like the mid 30s, before 48. Um, and he says there is this form of sexual attraction, which occurs in and as part of racism. And, and so what I'm saying there is, I think if I was, 10 years ago, I would have been far more iconoclastic and said, Let, let's get rid of traditional social psychology or whatever. Now, now, I don't think so. I mean, it's not my main cup of tea, right? I mean, I'm more interested in the kind of fan art stuff. But if you look carefully, sometimes you find little moments of radical insight and quite like, what? Did he actually did he say that? And some of these guys did say that. And, and it's worth, I think, going back to that. But I mean, just another, I mean, I'll better stop. Maybe ask another question. <laughs> No, 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 I think you can continue because as, as I'm listening to you, I'm also thinking about, you know, one of the theories in social psychology, the bystander effect, where it's all about you see somebody and you decide whether to help or not and there are certain things that make you not to help or not. And, and also thinking about where that theory comes from. It's about this man who killed this woman and 38 people were watching and they didn't do anything. And that's pretty much the story. And because of that, you know, at that time they thought about why do people help and why don't they help? And that's just that. And the theory comes out of that in trying to understand why people do things that way. And it's almost as if it's divorced from other things or the situation itself. Other things are not part of the conversation. And um, one of the experiences I had, because this is something that you read in a textbook here in South Africa, I don't know the background. I go to the U.S. and then I get to be in that space and I learn about the background. So there's a black man who shot a white woman somewhere in Queens. And now you're thinking about issues of gender, you're thinking about issues of race, you're thinking about issues of place, which were not part of the story. So I think about what is it that's, mi that's missing when you're thinking about the theories that we read without even being critical about them. And this is something that Sherry, friend Sherry, uh, interrogated and dealt with and say, when within social psychology, that's one of the, the issues or the things that we tend to be guilty of, that we look at issues and then we theorize, and then the importance of looking at the politics of it, the history of it, the context of it, it's very important for us when we try to imagine and understand. And that, I think, speaks to what we're talking about now in terms of looking at uh, the gays and, and um, who's looking at whom. And then that brings me to the issue of the body. I'd like us to talk about the body. Uh, okay. Because when you're talking about Fanon and the little child looking at him, the child is looking at this person, looking at this body, looking at this dark body. And, um, mm -hmm. and you argue that you know, look, we need to look at the body as not just being singular, but as something that is affected, but also affecting others. So we look at that scenario where this black body is affecting this child, instilling fear in this child. But how is, or how is that also in that moment affecting Fanon in that, in that particular moment? So just how the, the multiplicity of the body as something that is raised, as something that is classed, as something that is gendered, and our understanding of, of that. I don't know if you want to speak to that. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the body stuff is, is interesting. I, I always feel it was one of the topics I was writing things, publishing things, um, putting things together in a book, and then suddenly realized I hadn't intended it, but virtually every chapter in the book had the body as a, as a kind of subtext. It was there somehow. Um, corporeality, physicality. Um, and one of the themes which captured my imagination was um, coming, growing up in this time of post-structuralism, social constructionism, deconstruction was very much the, the, the rage. I mean, I was very much um, engaging with all that stuff. But it seemed to me that social constructionism hit a bit of a wall. And I'll give you an example. You know, often people say you must talk about race in inverted commas because race is socially constructed. 
Okay, it is, right? Socially constructed. But it's so much more than that. It's not just socially constructed, because that makes it sound like once we just put inverted commas, it's not going to exist, right? Or, or we can unlearn it or something. But one of the, the additional historical resources that I still think we don't make enough use of within South African psychology is Giovanni Magani. Um, and, and, and it's so sort of funny that you go on this journey. I mean, you know, I suppose I can just individualize it for a moment and say it's just because I'm like stuck in this kind of whatever white Eurocentric thing. But even when I think I'm doing critical psychology, I'm always like 10 miles behind. Like, because even to, to do, um, you know, do Fanon or, or Black Conscience, I mean, right, in fact, as you were telling me, in this building, Giovanni Mangani used to be here. And I think that his work is incredibly evocative and powerful. But he takes his early PhD work and some of his first publications are very primarily about embodiment. And one of the things that he wants to argue, if I get him right, is that, and why I find him such a, a useful historical resource against a kind of banal form of social constructionism, which just wants to say race is socially constructed, is he makes it apparent that race isn't just socially constructed, it's also uh, an ex it's a phenomenological experiential loading of a whole sorts, which means that it has this kind of existence of experience, of embodiment. And so one thing I spent a lot of time on trying to understand was the visceral qualities of certain forms of racism. So the, the more, the, the, there's multiple levels, but the, the one question for me would always be why, why does racism always return back to the body? Because you could say that more sophisticated racism gets and it, it uses explanations of culture, uh, cultural difference rather than just bodily stuff. But it often comes back and comes back to the body. And um, I always remember seeing this guy on TV, he was being interviewed, he was a guy from um, Urania. And someone said, hey, what's the story with Urania? Like, why? What's the race difference? And he says, look, you know, I mean, uh, <clears throat> if you take the, the stomach of a white man and the stomach of a black man, physically they are different. They've got a different anatomical structure. And the, the reason I mention that is not to ridicule that guy, but just to say that, like, that, that was... That was his belief, right? I mean, he, 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 he saw race being grounded in a, a fundamental, phys different physicality. And now to, to, to take a step further, I, again, I'm not trying to ridicule that guy, and I'm also not trying to suggest that we are also, because I think when you hear that story, it's easy to dismiss it and then say, like, ah, oh, you know, we're so much more sophisticated than that. But one of the things that's useful about a little bit of psychoanalytic thinking is that sometimes it can be the case that in a more enlightened intellectual way, you can easily dismiss that and say, I don't believe that. But I, I, I sometimes wonder, is that still part of racializing belief? That even if we don't think it, and even if we know intellectually to dismiss it, <coughs> do we still somehow believe it, oddly? And I mean, I suppose it differs, right? I can't say everyone. I mean, maybe it's differently loaded depending on how you locate yourself racially. But, you know, there's these little moments um, when I, I, I wonder whether that belief still somehow exists, even if it's slightly subliminal. Mm -hmm. But, okay, that's, that's one question. Coming back to Mangani, though, he spent a lot of work trying to understand the experiences of embodiment, the experiences of one's body. Um, and I think why it is so incredibly important for him and also for Fanon was that... Um, the context of radical racism is one that, that, that does two things. It emphasizes bodiliness, and it tries to, to give, let's just say, these are crude categories, but it tries to give white subjects and black subjects different modes of embodiment or different experiences of embodiment. Now, this, there's a limitation to this thinking, because how do we know that? But part of what Chibani Mangani would argue was that it's, it's almost as if there's different modes of embodiment so that in the cultural description and production of value, whiteness is supposed to sort of gravitate towards intellectuality, in, in, in towards some kind of movement beyond the mere body. Whereas in colonial eras, apartheid racism, all that stuff, blackness is supposed to be merely corporeal, merely body. Um, there's a, also a very good Ashila Bembe quote when he kind of tries to outline what he would term something you could call it the, the philosophy to give it an overly grand term of colonialism. And he, he says something like, um, the black body is, is, is essentially inertia. It's linked to the earth. It's of the earth. It can be owned. I mean, this is radical racism that he's talking about. And it's, it's uncomfortable even to read it. But you, you, you get a sense that that was part of that mentality. That was part of what it was about. 
And I think we've got another whole discussion to have about this. What becomes very uncomfortable and very difficult is to, to what extent do you want to try and, and find out about that form of racism? Because it's, 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 it's brutal even to talk about it, and it runs the risk of talking about it as it were almost kind of re-triggering it. But the flip side is if you just ignore it and you don't engage with it, does it not stay there, right? It's a big ethical dilemma, and I know you've engaged with it, and we could talk about a, a very grounded example of that. But just one other point to make about that, <clears throat> uh, two points. One is to say, how is it, in, partly in my work with this group of colleagues called the Apartheid Archive Project, we try to collect a whole series of, of contributions, little spoken extracts about people talking about apartheid racism. It doesn't really happen there, but every now and again, there's the sense that, that, that racism was a visceral thing. Even in the, in the sense of it's okay to touch the hand of a white colleague, but whoa, if you're white and, and lots of black people around you are touching you, suddenly there's this like reaction, right? I mean, I, it depends. And so I got interested in, in those theorists who were trying to understand how that happens. Like, why would you have a bodily fear or an almost visceral reaction to the so-called racial other? There's not more to say about that topic, but just to, to highlight for me for a while, that was of considerable interest. Because what it means is that you can't just unlearn racism by kind of enlightening yourself and being more intellectually aware of it. It's also somehow rooted in the, in the I want to use the term very cautiously, the kind of, it's pre-discursive, which is not to say pre-symbolic, but it, it's, it, it's kind of in those visceral, the viscera of reactions, the, 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 the instantaneous, physical reaction before one is even thinking that one should react in that kind of way. So it's, it's a complex topic, but I found that interesting because it means that it's kind of rooted almost in a quasi, and I want to emphasize that, quasi, sort of like instinctual aversion. There's lots of theorists who want to talk about it, aversive notions of racism, the abject, all that stuff. So there was, there was a long piece of work that I was interested in, whether it's been satisfactorily resolved intellectually or otherwise, I don't know, and whether that's still how racism, the predominant mode of it in, in post-apartheid or post-colonial societies, I don't know either. Actually, I think sometimes you get the flip side. You get a kind of fetishization, whereby there's, you know, uh, in a way the opposite, the, the, the gravitation to, for the white subject to somehow prove you're not racist by, you know, having black friends or something. Um, Again, another whole debate. But one last point to, to, to bring up about that is um, Puleng and, and I had a, a bit of a conversation because only about a year, two years ago, I did this paper on, on representations of black bodies. And um, I started finding these images, part of the work in the apartheid archive. And I also remembered an image from my childhood of, I think it was the report or the bill, I, I think it was the report newspaper. Um, and um, I'm, I'm not wearing my glasses, so I can't see how old you guys are, sorry not to be ages. Some of you may have seen this thing, I, I remember seeing it, and then many, many years later when I was at Vitz, they had an art history slide library, where they had slides of thousands of different art images and popular cultural images. So I must have been in like third year, this would be about 1993, and I was looking through all the images in South Africa, and there I saw this thing from a report newspaper, was reported me. It was a Sunday newspaper, and it had a, a, an MK guy who tried to plant a bomb in Pretoria, actually. Uh, and he'd been blown up. The bomb had gone off prematurely. And they showed a double front and back cover picture of this guy blown to pieces on a Sunday newspaper. Um, anyways, and I found this image, and then in the apartheid archive stuff, that asked for me was an important question. Like, why would you do that? Why would you show that image? And then I started trying to look for images and, and realized that that not just in South Africa, but and, and sometimes even in potentially progressive forums, like the Bang Bang Club, those guys, Marinovich, they have lots of pictures of township violence. And Marinovich gets the um, Pulitzer for an image of... Kevin Carter, for the, the, the object. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So there's, there's, that's the second one. Kevin Carter gets a picture of a Pulitzer for um, a black emaciated child with a vulture looming yeah. behind. But the, before him, uh, Marinovich, Marinovich, whatever, he gets a Pulitzer for um, a man, Shabalala, being stabbed yeah. and set on light. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so then the question was, I mean, why does this trope, this, this image, keep on coming back? And it, it was useful for me because I've often wondered, Fanon does it really well. He talks about some kind of fantasy underlying racism. 
And in terms of embodiment and racialization, I think those type of images, which incidentally haven't gone away, because even when Marikana happens, you, know, you get these pictures, these publicized images of bodies, dead bodies, and you don't show white bodies like that. Okay. Yeah. So like, there was a whole argument to be made about that, and, and I, I thought it was, was kind of important. But the point I'm getting at is, uh, Poulain had kind of alluded to this in a, in a gentle way, is how are you implicated in the research that you're doing? So I was interested in those forms of racism, and I think it is important to investigate that stuff. Why does that trope of particularly the black body in pieces keep on being shown, even in a post-apartheid? Um, and um, Ndebele had said, well, you don't see this with white bodies. And until that starts to happen, I mean, I don't think he's suggesting you must now start finding images of black, uh, white bodies in pieces. But until the, that point finally hits home, like, those, those are not really appropriate images to show. Um, and I think there's also the kind of uh, subtraining point of, it, it, it's not even as if, it's not that one thinks I'm going to now, certainly with the Maranovich and those guys, they were trying to be anti-apartheid, but nonetheless they would still use those images, which seem to channel a form of not racism or racialization, I don't know, but still the subterranean presumption is it's okay to show those images, but it's not okay to show those. And of course if you take it outside of South Africa, you see those taboos in different contexts. So Judith Butler writes, I mean, I don't know if you remember this, but at a certain point in the Iraq war, you can't even show American soldiers coffins, let alone the American bodies. Yeah. Right? You must not even show the coffins. Mm. So there's radically different rules of representation for which bodies you can show in which ways, in which states of destruction. So that's a fascinating research project, I think. And I think it also points to how there are implicit categories of racialization which, through which we filter what can be shown which is not just psychological, but so on and so forth. But Poulain's point was, Derek, uh, why are you interested in this? <laughs> I mean, uh, maybe I'm not <laughs> doing justice to your argument. But when I ref refer to the ethical dimension of these things, I think it is a problem. Because even to talk about those forms of racism, or to somehow be seen to be so preoccupied with that kind of imagery, what does it say about you? Um, and you know, the first time I heard that critique, I said, hey, man, it's, it's not really about me. It's that this is something one needs to see. This is a form of racism. But I think that, and maybe this is where the psychological thing does help sometimes, is you are still implicated in the research you are doing. Like, and whether you realize it or not, maybe it still underlines some kind of racial fascination that you've got. You know? So that wasn't a particularly pleasant journey for me, but I think it, it was an important realization. Um, and I leave it as a question because I don't know how to resolve it. I think there's a bit of an impasse here. On the one hand, if you're going to try and understand and somehow disable continue, continuing forms of racialization and racism, do you not also need to understand something about its most obdurate and brutal historical forms? Perhaps you do. But in doing that, are you not doing some weird kind of intellectual racism tourism? That, that, that I think is a question. Um, and I think in some, I think it's a little bit undecidable. Sometimes you aren't and sometimes you are. And it presumably it depends on the type of the research you're doing it. Right? And if you're like the white guy, you know. Um, so I think sometimes you are and sometimes you aren't. But I, I, I suppose I'm just emphasizing that even in the mode, the very precise moment of thinking you're being critical, you may open the door to um, some kind of enjoyment in images that one is trying to critique. Um, that's a very long-winded and slightly divergent answer, but it, it, it links to some stuff about embodiment. I mean, I don't know if you agree. Yeah. No, 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 I agree. And I think that's, that's very important. And I think it will be helpful for some of our students sitting in the room as well to, to think about when, you, when you're doing research about the reasons why you're doing it in the first place and how you as the researcher are implicated in the work that you're doing. Because oftentimes we tend to think that we're standing here and this is what we're doing. But the, the idea that you're doing that particular kind of work, you know, um, why is that and, and how are you implicated in that work, I think is very important as, as we make decisions in terms of the kind of work that we do and how we do it and how it might come across. Who's the audience and how is the audience going to receive that? And how, again, are they going to think about the author or the person who's writing? So being in conversation with your work also helped me to be able to do that and then hopefully also yeah make you start thinking about <laughs> some of the things that sometimes you take for granted. Um, just again coming back to to your work, your own work, you're very you know you, you say and it comes out in your work as well that you're very 
inspired by Foucault's work, you know, the, the, the discursive analytic uh, part of his work and post-coloniality and then psychoanalysis. So in, in bringing those together, um, I just want you maybe to speak a little bit about um, how you draw from Foucault and then also just about discourse analysis and how you apply that because I know some of my students are here and this is a selfish okay, yeah. agenda for me so yeah, maybe they can yeah, take something from that in terms of how you apply that in your work. Yeah, so what do you take from Foucault? I mean, um, I mean he, does, he does lots of stuff in his career and I actually can't really pretend to be a Foucault expert. But I suppose one of the things that initially got me thinking about Foucault was he was kind of saying that there's various forms, overlapping modalities of power that are present. Um, and what he was also saying, and here he is a little bit iconoclastic, he was saying don't just, don't rely on existing theories of power. Don't, if you just look at Marxist structures of power, which say power is a top-down force which is coercing and squashing us, you miss the point. And he comes up with a whole series of very counterintuitive and I think quite radical uh, suggestions. One is to say that sometimes we contribute to the power. I mean, that's not him saying that alone. But that's, that's, I mean, yeah, you can see it in lots of different places. And again, we go back to the Sibu with him. He also, in a way, says that. But also, he's saying power is productive. So we make it. Um, so, you know, his famous example is if you stick with the whole Freudian model or one view of the Freudian model, you think that sexuality is repressed. We mustn't talk about sex. And all that. He says, well, I don't know about that anymore. It seems to me that these days we talk an awful lot about sex. You know, you got whatever the cosmopolitan newspaper thing about like how to have a great orgasm. I've followed those tips that don't work, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, maybe that's because they're not for me. But, yeah. um, and so he says, no, we're continually producing power. We, we, we feel condemned to talk about ourselves, to individualize ourselves, to express ourselves to discursively produce our subjectivities, to categorize ourselves, to think about our sexuality, all of these things, which he says, and you can see why this is of interest to me from coming from a psychological perspective, because in a way, he would suggest that that exact impetus to individualize, to realize yourself, to realize your distinctive individuality, is also a way of conducting power through you, right? Like today, to take a funny example, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, for us not to make certain decisions about am I gay, am I straight, what, you know. And he would argue that in different historical eras, you don't have to categorize your own sexuality or interrogate it in quite the same way. So that's just one little opening for Foucault. Um, you know, some people are now, I think, looking more at some of his later work. But of course, the, the crucial thing also about Foucault is that he, he starts using the notion of a discourse. And interestingly, I did my little semi-critique of social constructionism earlier. I still think social constructionism is, is, is tremendously important. But I think also what Foucault brings to it is he's saying that a discourse, a form of knowledge, a form of representation, a form of understanding, texts that build the world aren't just texts. They're not just words. They're not just textbooks. The, the tenor of the earlier discussion to say, well, let's have new textbooks in a way is also to say, let's have a new discourse. Let's have a new, new open up new resources to think critically about psychology. But he wants to say, discourse, a modality of power, is not just representations. It is that, in a way, race is socially constructed. But that's not the only way it lives. It lives through modes of experience, um, self-fulfilling prophecies modes of experience, but also for him, practices. And this, I think, is interesting. So if you go to a prison, he will say the way power works here is partly by all the book burning, what does criminology, what does the sociology of prisons tell you, or if you are a counseling student and you've got all this knowledge of, okay, this is how you work with prisoners, and I'm not belittling that because it's something I'll try to do, it's, it's difficult, you come in with a certain series of concepts and conceptualizations of who stu uh, students, and yes, students instead of prisoners, right? Prisoners. <laughs> um, what prisoners are, so you bring all the knowledge in. And whether it's prison warders or people who make the policy of prisons, they're also using some forms of knowledge. Mm -hmm. and, and some forms of discourse analysis will interrogate all that stuff. But he says, don't forget about the materiality. So how's the cell arranged? Why are we sitting in this particular way? Why is it that there's a particular way of handling the keys? All of those small details. And I think that sometimes gets forgotten in, in excitement about discourse analysis. The actual materialities of power. So for him, it's interesting if he goes back long enough ago to look at how the mad were treated. He wants to know what was the kind of chair that you tied the mad person up before you threw water on them. What were the particular procedures? 
Because sometimes it's those materialities, those physicalities, those modes of practice which become the basis of new forms of knowledge. So that, I think, is, is, is crucial about Foucault. And one thing that will help us just look at the basic materialities, the practices, the organizations of space that are absolutely integral to any form of power. So just to make the point one last time, you don't do a discourse analysis for Foucault just by looking at words. Some people can. You could do that. But for him, it's words as related in a cyclical, reiterative pattern with materialities, forms of practice, forms of division. Those kinds of things, um, and I think that's that is crucial still. Yeah, I agree. I think I think that's that's very important. So I think maybe just as we draw to a close, I'm going to open up uh, to my colleagues to maybe have a conversation with you as well, uh, if they have any comments they'd like to make or questions that they'd like to make. But before we we do that, so what's Derek up to now? What are you busy with? Uh, what's in the horizon? <laughs> That's always the difficult questions. Um, <clears throat> what I'm trying to do at the moment, actually, is to think about. You'd mentioned a little bit about psychoanalysis, and I, I didn't really want to speak about it too much because it's, you know, there's so much ammunition and reason to critique various forms of psychoanalysis that it becomes quite a sort of labored process by saying what aspects you're trying to use. But one of the things that I'm interested in now, which may sound as, as if it has a certain continuity with that stuff, um, but also a certain difference, is to ask how could you have. Um, a model of community, or let's put things a slightly different way. There seems to be a new phase. People talked about the discursive term or the textual term in the 90s. Now people are talking about the affective term. The idea almost that we've spent so much time looking at social constructionism, text, representations, words, people start to say, but what about affects, passions, emotions? So there's a whole lot of work that's starting to come out. Not all of it that I find completely convincing, actually. Although it does link a little bit to when I was talking about the, the visceral qualities of, of racism and, and, and racial whatever stuff practice. Which means that you can't fully understand those, those types of behavior just by looking at text and social constructions. I would argue you also need to look at forms of affect. So I've been toying a little bit with some of these ideas to ask, what are the crucial affects, the passions, that make a given community? Step one. Step two is to say, are there newly emerging communities in post-apartheid South Africa? Or are those affective communities, whatever they may be, wherever they may exist, small or large scale, do they fall back into traditional, more racialized lines? But then to zoom in a little bit, one of the things that I wanted to do is to say, could we actually have a methodology? Could we have a model of a community of affects? And for me, the argument would then be, it's hard to know when a community exists or which is the bigger one, which is the smaller. But here are some questions to ask. If this given group of people, if they are indeed a community, do they have a given social complaint, a symptom? What is the thing they routinely complain about? And um, you know, I've only been back in South Africa for three weeks or whatever, but because you look at the newspapers, there is at least one answer. What is the symptom? What is, do South Africans or different communities complain about? Surely it's different things. But Jacob Zoom has got to be there somewhere because a lot of people seem to be, again, you know, it's difficult to generalize, but certainly from some newspapers, he's like, people talk about him a lot. But without, without generalizing, let's keep it open as a research model. So we, we, we ask, what does a given community complain about? What is their symptom? That would be one. The other is, what is their, the thing they fear? What is the thing that is worrying to them? And in different sectors and different South African communities, it will be different. But there will be one. And the most potent one that I found, and again, you'll potentially accuse me of being a bit kind of racialized in this, so be it, but I, I got to like, open up my research. But one of the most powerful ones that I've come across, just in speaking to some colleagues within some white communities, presumably more Afrikaans communities, is, is farm killings. This is the horrific, terrible thing. And importantly, in doing this research, I'm not saying it's irrational, I'm saying that thing is there, right? Maybe, but it, it, without, again, it becomes problematic to provide examples because then it's, they, they scatter examples are too big or too small. But I'm just trying to animate the model. So the second question is, what is the, what is the terrifying thing? What is the nightmare? And a given community should be, presumably if the theory is right, will be premised on something that they are afraid of. The third thing is, what is the lost object? What is the mode of nostalgia? What was better before? What could one day come? If only things would be better if this. So that is, it's, again, it's a bit of a Freudian idea. What's the lost thing? or the thing to aspire. And sometimes that can have quite a, a utopian element to it. Sometimes it's like, oh, things were better before. And sometimes it actually invokes a, a concrete enemy. 
like if this person wasn't here, things would be better. So that's a third question. Then there's a fourth and a fifth, which we don't really have to go into, but that's what I'm trying to, to work on, which is both methodology, a way of doing some kind of interviews, a way of trying to get a model in a given community, and to ask about the affective bonds that holds a given community together. What would be interesting for me to find out is, can you do that on a kind of national scale? People would say it's too broad because South Africa is still too fragmented. But sometimes, like one of them, one of my questions is, what's the master signifier? The thing that keeps on coming up, the source of values, the, the source that gives us some kind of rooting or grounding. And there was a huge, huge amount of coverage of Mandela's death, certainly in Britain, and no doubt here, obviously, as well. So much so, incidentally, funnily enough, that there were complaints in Britain that oh, we've had too much of this, which I also found a bit suspect. But that would be one of them. Mandela is, I think, a master signifier, something that many, many different constituencies and groups will refer to in deploying his name and its value in slightly different ways. But it's one thing. And I suppose what I'm also interested in is, is are there moments where small communities have something in common with bigger communities? And can you even talk about a South African nation? That's another question. People would have different answers to that. Empirically, intuitively, it says on the map it's there, but is it, <laughs> is it a South African nation? You know, Mbeki had said years ago, famously, that there's two. I don't know, maybe there's more, maybe there's less. Maybe there isn't one at all. But um, yeah, that's just some suggestions of what I'm trying to do. Sounds like you have your work cut out for you. OK. Sounds like a very big project, but a worthwhile. <coughs> Yeah, One, yes, yeah. And I think on that note, um, I'm going to give you the opportunity to have a conversation with Derek. Any questions that you might want to direct to him or a comment that you might want to make? Yes, Tabla. <coughs> yeah, um, well, just a note, I think Nebula and Rwanda identified at a stage four nation. I mean, and before that, uh, uh, I mean, you know, the, the, the idea of the consolidation of the different types of nations in South Africa, uh, I think that's just an interesting point. And, uh, my question is on, on iconoclasticism. Like, uh, I think that's, a, well, at least I think it's something we all engage with to an extent, like interdisciplinary, anti-disciplinary, like to what extent do we push the discipline, to what extent do we, do we stay, you know, do we stay uh, loyal to the discipline? I mean. And I think, you know, at least for me, I think it's important to realize, um, and I, you know, I want to ask you maybe, like, how you negotiate this. Like, in philosophy, there's a certain tradition, um, certain words, certain, well, not words, certain concepts. Even what a concept is, is defined differently. It has a, you know, it has a certain history. In psychology, I'm sure this works also with certain concepts and methodologies. You know, I, I cannot speak, but to what extent, because, it, Interdisciplinarity is no problem, but then I need to acknowledge if I want to talk about psychology, I need to sit down and I need to read that psychology, I need to understand that, and then we can then we can start playing, you know, then one can start playing it. But I mean, to what ex I mean, how how do you negotiate this for yourself? I mean, I mean, does it become a thing of a personal ethic and a personal understanding of I need to put the work, I need to put the work in? Because on the other hand, I mean, this this becomes the one of the big ills of postmodernism, that one can one can pick. I mean, one can use a little sociology, you can use a little psychology, a little philosophy, maybe a little. I mean, the so-called affair, a little you know, a little engineering for that matter, to make you know, to make your argument. But I mean, is that is that really? Are we really moving towards a stage where all that we say, all disciplines are fascist, and or? I mean, how do we negotiate this? How do we how do we think our discipline anew without you know without how do we make it relevant? How do we make it contextual without throwing it completely away? Without you know without disrespecting? I mean, and you were saying making this point with the social psychologist. I mean, this guy may be a bit of you know uh, a old school you know Afrikaner, but in 1935 he was making this point. And I mean, if one just completely turns your back on it, like. The possibilities for this, you know, for this engagement is not, you know, won't be there. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I suppose I agree with that. I mean, I suppose to say several things. One is, one shouldn't neglect the the, the historical import of. I mean, maybe, and again, it's so difficult to say this more generally because psychology has its own particular disciplinary history, which tends to mean that it, it's not as multidisciplinary as perhaps other disciplines are. Meaning. Risk a very big generalization. And it's also got this historical amnesia thing. 
doesn't really, you know, it, it, I mean, often you get this kind of thing, I don't know if you were alluding to it earlier, that in historic, in psychology journals, you need to make sure your references are in the last five years. If, if your references are too old, then they're like, okay, what are you doing? Making the presumption that what's more recent is more cutting edge. It's not always the case. So, depending on your discipline, there's an immense amount of interesting and critical work that can be done simply by engaging with Giovanni Mangani, Heidi McCrony. So, I suppose that, that is a crucial point. Um, I mean, maybe just also to mention, things get difficult because on the one hand, again, maybe it's more psychology. I think there are people who do very good multidisciplinary work, right? And it does exist. But I think it's actually quite hard to do it really well because to do multidisciplinary work really well means you need to be pretty well versed in more than one discipline, which is quite hard to do. You need a lot of intellectual time and labor and whatever skills to do it. So I think it does happen. Maybe it's a bit more difficult. And sometimes I think it's a bit of a too easy critique just to say, well, we should be doing more multidisciplinary stuff when people are. Um, so all of those things are important. And there was something else, but it'll come back to me. Did you want to add this yeah. um, I'm just adding on to that, but also going back to the idea that you have critical psychology as something separate to what psychology should be doing in the first place has always been something that's yeah. bugged me. Yeah. It implies that the critical part of psychology is a <coughs> special function that we can do as we choose to, and that psychology itself as a standard doesn't have that function, that there's a pure form of psychology that critical psychology doesn't make a part of. And when working from within that critical idea, it seems like, to use African psychology as an example, that one must first induct African into psychology before we can start critiquing the idea of an African psychology. And there I often find that the methods we're trying to bring in that don't exist in psychology before are then relegated to the um, philosophy or outside of the discipline. Yes. Um, an example I'd love to use is Malusi's work on drumming as a data collection technique. Um, but to do that, he first has to make it psychological in the traditional sense, and then it gets judged according to the psychological traditions and is found wanting and is therefore not a good technique. Um, how do you balance those tensions? Yeah, it's, I mean, <clears throat> I've emphasized that it's one, in making these kinds of comments, one needs to be specific about the discipline, but I think one also needs to be specific about the location and the historical uh, position of the discipline. So sometimes, as I mentioned before, for me, it didn't feel as oppressively delimiting in South African psychology at the given time when I was trying to do stuff, where it does feel far more so outside of psychology in certainly uh, institutions. And oddly enough, like, Again, I haven't checked this recently, but the most conservative form of psychology in, in British uh, academia, I'm guessing, is at Oxford or Cambridge, right? Because there, those boundaries are in place. Um, so for me, one of the answers was just not to be in psychology. Um, I don't think that would necessarily, I, I, I think I'd still be able to do the kind of stuff I'm doing in a South African psychology department. But in this kind of ra rarefied ivory tower of somewhere like the London School of Economics, they want you to publish in these journals. And that then also interestingly becomes linked to promotion, and that becomes linked to tenure, and then becomes linked to whether you've got a viable ongoing career at that institution, because everyone's work is evaluated, and all that kind of stuff. So when it gets to that point, the institutional trappings are so coercive that I think it's, it's useful trying to be able to do something outside of that. Of course, to be less of a rebel or whatever, you know, sometimes you can play the game up to a point and just start doing your own kind of work publishing in places that are receptive to you. It's, it's very much, I think, in, in that respect, a personal choice. I mean, I discussed Chibani Mangani earlier, and another reason why I find him a bit of a role model was, I mean, he did what I think is pretty important foundational stuff in South African psychology. He was doing a little bit of, you know, psychoanalysis, he liked this, he liked existential thought, he was, you know, he was, he was engaging with black consciousness, a whole series of things, and then later moved out of psychology, and in fact, interestingly, started doing lots of life writing. Mm -hmm. By your biographical writing. Um, I feel I'm going a similar kind of way. I feel more excited about doing that. But I think it's also just about, you, I think as scholars, as intellectuals, as, as whatever people do writing, you, you need to be doing the kind of work that keeps you going and that, that, that opens up things and you can do something new. And for some people, they quite happily can do that within a discipline. And just one last point there. I think that if you get the positioning right, I mean, maybe the drumming thing is a bit difficult. You're going to come up against lots of whatever, you know, people who say that's not methodology. 
But sometimes you can actually make a bit of a career for yourself by being within social psychology and saying, hey, there's some other voices, there's some other perspectives that we can bring in here. And depending on how you blend it, you, you could do that. Um, I mean, so again, this is a bit of an institutional thing, but in terms of the, the book I did on the critical psychology of the post-colonial, um, you know, I could have just written a book about family, but I wanted it to be on that, that, that cusp because it meant that colleagues in psychology started reading that. So you, you can get to work for you sometimes, but you've got to get the balance right, because sometimes other people just put the book down and now they've got to open it when they think it's, it's not quite their cup of tea. So I think it can actually, despite having emphasized how it can be coercive and restrictive, I think it can also be a, a creative space if you are fortunate in how you position the institution you're at, if that's yeah. important. I think that's a good point, Dave. If you're fortunate enough to be well positioned in the institution <laughs> that you find yourself in, it's a very good point there. Um, yes, Dumis? Uh, I have two questions. The first question, it relates to a conversation I had with a friend late last week who expressed surprise, dismay even when seeing the poster and realizing that you're a white guy. Oh. <laughs> he, according to, you know, he had made the assumption until then that uh, that you were a, a black Brit. Uh, you know, and at that point, like, he realized that you were actually white. So a conversation then came about in which he was speaking about the way in which you know white supremacy operates in the academe is that work which we might call black or liberatory work which which is is critical of of oppression actually generates its reputation and place in the academy only when picked up by by white authors to the point that black authors who have been dealing with this work for a long time, even when the work is about white supremacy itself, uh, you know, then become subject in, in the hierarchy of publishing and their allocation. Nigel Gibson is a good point. He, even within the South African academe, I mean, the, the, the experts who are understood on, on various kinds of subjects, you know, that the very structures which the work operates in critique of, uh, you know, operate with regards to their work itself and the place which it becomes ascribed within the academe, thereby reproducing its own contents while distancing itself from them. That in, in the world, and I, I think this is some this is some of the critical work that comes out from Miko or, or much earlier before him or also Uwe in Lambert, which leads to the suspension the, the suspension of the society of cooperation so long as white supremacy exists precisely because the impossibility of extricating whiteness from that given subject means that he's, if you will, use such terms, condemned to, you know, to, to that benefit so long as this world exists. And so in that world, even this kind of progressive gesture nevertheless feeds into the same regressive structure which reproduces those hierarchies even in the, you know, so that this becomes serious because you write about it. And if I wrote about it, it wouldn't be. And now you can invite me even though, and we've seen this thing happening a lot. I mean, whether it happens in the direct, in the world of theory itself or in practice or on the ground, you know. The second question I wanted to ask. Could we just, uh, otherwise I'll forget stuff. Do you want to right. just respond to that? How is Nigel Gibson treated in South Africa or thought of? What, what you alluded to a little bit, I don't know all the history. Well, it depends who is treating him. Uh, amongst, amongst the liberal academy, I think he's a darling of Rhodes, he's a darling at Vitz. Yeah, he's an authoritative authority source on Fanon. Yeah, yeah, he's an authority on Fanon in some circles. In other circles, he's seen as the, the worst scourge, you know. Uh, so it, it depends for who, you know. It, it, it also depends, but in, in the world of formal publishing, he's considered a great authority. But on the ground, within the movements themselves, and the informal world of pamphleteering, and people engaged in the people's struggles, he's seen with a great deal of suspicion okay. as the new form of white supremacy, which is yes. conscious of itself, but continues itself through the celebration of its consciousness. Yes. The second question I wanted to ask was, you seem to make an identification of apartheid, like as a, I don't know whether it's a historiographical point, but there was a sort of 
parenthetical comment you made when identifying the fellow advocates that in fact he ruled before apartheid. So my question is, I, I, you know, in liberal historiography, there's a tendency to celebrate apartheid. Uh, and by celebrate, I mean it's identified as the period of commencement of a special kind of evil, which is discontinuous with whatever comes. You know, uh, uh, Bernard Makubane problematizes this in the early 90s, for instance, looking at the history of historiography in South Africa, that, in fact, whatever is called apartheid already has its components, you know, for, for 200 years or so in South Africa. That specific juridical political arrangement, which gives itself that name, everything from uh, Immorality Act has its, it already its history in 1927, the past law experiments already in the Cape in the 1800s, so that whatever is celebrated as apartheid is actually also a mode of vindicating liberal political participation, that it's them, the nationalists are responsible, and that the, this idea has taken hedge of, nobody can think before apartheid, like the idea that apartheid is a special political period, has taken such a heightened form that no one can think. So I, I see that you, you do this. So I'm, I'm actually interested to find out what you think is so special about apartheid like in South African days. Yeah. I, I think it's a good point. Um, I suppose what I'm interested in, and it's, it's curious to have made that parenthetical comment, I suppose my assumption was that apartheid 48 brings uh, an intensification and legislation of a whole series of informal and structured forms of racism that were clearly there before. So that much I agree with. And I think also your, your comment is very opposite in saying that there is this kind of tacit, if not probably explicit, celebration of racism in his historiography. I mean, it links also to your first question. You know, there's this thing somewhere in the, the beginning of Edward Said's uh, Orientalism. He says, he quotes someone who says, but Orient is a career. And if I, if I can bring together two of your comments, and just basically come clean, I suppose, I could say that I've, I've made a career out of uh, South African politics or South African psychology, <coughs> or indeed racism, or indeed family, or indeed Pico. You know? So the, the comment you may make of Nigel Gibson, you can certainly lay at my door as well. I mean, I don't think I'm quite as illustrious as Nigel Gibson, but it's true. Right? I mean, that, that's, that's the way, and you, you, you see, I mean, <clears throat> I've only kind of gradually realized it, although it's, it's patently obvious. Someone told me this years ago, when I was trying to publish on Foucault, he said, hey, if you publish on Foucault, you're just another guy who's publishing on Foucault. Talk about South Africa and Foucault, and you become sexy. I mean, he didn't, he didn't say it in exactly those terms, so that's what he meant. And it's true. You know, suddenly publishers want to listen, suddenly people will be more interested. Um, and your point would also be that it's, it's typically the, the, the field of white academia, you know, whatever, privileged middle class whites or whatever, we can make careers out of that. It's so patently true that I don't even know if we need to reiterate it. Um, so I, I agree. I agree with that. Um, but just coming back to the apartheid thing, I sometimes wonder, it's a, it's a bit like, and this is, is a hopeful wondering, which is perhaps just pure art, but Weren't things this, I mean, accepting the history of colonization, everything that was happening prior to 48, was it not a little bit different in 35 to 48? Maybe not. But I mean, one of the Foucauldian things is to say also, is South Africa different today, right here and right now in this room, in the politics of how things are managed, whether it is the white guy talking whatever, to, to what they were 20 years ago? Maybe not. Maybe somehow, yes, though. And I suppose what I want to ask then, and what I'm curious about, I'm not a historian, um, so I don't really know, but were there some different opportunities in 35 as opposed to 48? And I suppose what I'm wondering is, was the intellectual atmosphere slightly different then to what it would have been in 55? Um, and I kind of am tempted to think that maybe McCrony couldn't have published the same book in 75 to what he could in 35. It's so open to question. I, I agree with what you say, but that, that element of, um, and I suppose I'm also just interested in, in what was, what, what like uh, male black franchise in the Cape still existed up to a certain point, right? I don't know when it, when it was cut away, but I think those moments in history are important to try and think about. But anyways, I, I don't necessarily have the equipment to do it.
But going back to the other Nigel Gibson point, um, I think there are people who make careers out of South Africa. Huge numbers of, and, and weirdly enough, it's often white academics who go away from South Africa and then rediscover how fascinated they are by South Africa. And again, you know, guilty as charged. Um, but what do you do about them? What do you do about these problematic guys? Um, you criticize them, I suppose. But hey, I mean, going to Nigel Gibson, I'm happy that there's a Nigel Gibson, right? Maybe, you know, he's problematic, and maybe indeed the very gesture of critique is still a mode of supremacy in another way. Well, why isn't the most prominent inter world intellectual on, uh, on Fanon a black guy or woman? And, you know, some people say actually there are those comics. Yeah. But I, for all of it, I still wouldn't say let's throw out Nigel Gibson. You know, I'd say critique him, but I, I think I've learned stuff about Fanon I wouldn't have learned if he hadn't written that stuff. Maybe someone else would have. But I think there's still some value. But what do, what do, you, what do you think in response? Okay, uh, to the more recent question, what fascinates me is the extent to which the work itself acts as a violence against the author's study. In the case of Fanon, maybe not so, but in, in the history of African nationalist thought in South Africa, uh, which, which forms the basis of what later becomes so good and, and Biko, their position with regards to white people, and I suppose this, you know, there's a paper of yours in which you sort of try to study the reason for which white people participate in anti-racist struggles, if you will. That there's, there's various reasons for which this happens, which seem to be a form of kind of self-vindication, but that well, you know, these authors themselves actually make provisos against this, you know, for a very specific reason, suspecting precisely that this work will be exploited, that this struggle will be exploited. So I, I'm interested in the way in which the work itself actually fulfills the prophecy which is made by the work itself. That specifically takes a point to exclude, you know, if, if the purpose of the critical exercise is consciousness building, is, a, is actually operating against the system itself, there's, there's a proviso in the work that, you know, white man, not here, like, do your thing, but don't come here, you know. And, and this is a political programmatic, you know. So the, the fact is that this then operates as a transgression uh, under the pretense of respecting these authors actually violating the provisions which they make about their own struggles. This, this is the fascinating thing. And I think this friend of mine also identified it this way. As for the question of whether things were better or worse, I don't know. But I think one of the mischievous aspects of this historiographical construction is that one, for instance, South Africa and I think that the, 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 the African franchise in the Cape is a good example of how South African politics is a history of liberalism. I mean that the ANC itself is a liberal party from the get-go, from the students of Dr. Philip, who, who identified the struggle here as democratization rather than liberation. And we're caught in this trap, which leads us to celebrating, you know, to celebrating a universal franchise, you know, because of course we've had democracy for a much longer period in this country, if you count all the people who've been voting and their various constitutions, but this was extended and they understood this. So it legitimizes the understanding of the struggle for liberation as democratization rather than liberation. Mm -hmm. And one, it separates apartheid from conquest, that apartheid as a specific kind of construction is distinct from conquest. And so we have post-apartheid society, but not post-conquest society. And the tension between those two, you know, is resolved through the allocation of special power to apartheid. You know, because I think even post-1994, we have the continuation of pre-apartheid. Like, but there's, there's something wrong with this situation. I mean, the, the last loads of dispossession happened in 1913. You know, but before that, there's, but there's something wrong with the post-apartheid society because it returns us back to pre-apartheid society, which was already a very significant problem. But between the African nationalists and the English liberals is a kind of war that goes on in the way in which we use these categories of interpreting 
be again. No, let, let's give the others a chance. No, I will be sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think yeah. Thank you for that comment, Dumi. So that was a marvel. I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna give you a chance, and then I'm gonna give Derek the last word, and then I'm gonna close it. Yes. No. Uh, thanks, uh, Derek. Uh, in relation to the, the issue of uh, Nigel uh, Gibson, of course, we are expecting as a scholar, but we have heard this thing of. Uh, this white mean uh, missionarism, uh, which I will refer to in relation to social movement. We know that in this country, the god of our friend, our Saint John Dollar, is Richard Peterhouse. You can't uh, do anything else, uh, like with that social movement outside Richard uh, Peterhouse. And then, of course, you have this uh, black person uh, like who speak who, who, who speak on behalf of the movement, but who is controlled. By you know like uh, and, and 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 we've seen this like in terms of the cases like which have uh, or checked that the leader will be arrested and then the you know, person like, will tell the, the police no don't touch him you know? so we know like uh, those uh, but we've been having this thing the problem of speaking for others that's the problem that uh, we've been having and the question that which I want to uh, to ask you where do you locate Fanon? Uh, uh, epistemologically, because like I heard that you, you referred to to Fanon, uh, to Fanon in relation to postcolonialism, something which is even popular. But when one makes a reading of a uh, in white mask and even the region of the earth, and which I think the, the preface of the uh, of which you've given attention to in some of your uh, your works, is is a little bit distant from what Fanon uh, stands for uh, originally. Uh, in the text, like where are you getting a phenomenon? Is it a postcolonialism and how <coughs> feasible uh, is that? And what is your uh, interpretation of Chabani Mangani's uh, 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 conception uh, of the body in the anti black world? Because of like his uh, conception is the black uh, being black in the world. Mm -hmm. But my argument uh, is that. In relation to uh, look, the conception of the world will host human beings, right? In so far as humanity is concerned, but when you include the category of the black, the object that which does not possess any ontology, we can't have a world. We have the anti-black world because this is the world which militates against the the existence of blackness. So that's Chavani Mangani like a. Uh, does it give us like uh, some form of a resource to imagine that nationality uh, uh, in? And lastly, like, what is your interpretation of uh, the view of people and torture? There are, there are many questions that which I want to engage with. Yeah, those three. I think they will, yeah. Uh, can I add something? <laughs> what is the, how do you locate the whole thing about people and women? I mean, just also looking to the, okay, I'll, I'll try and say some things about some of the issues very briefly. I mean, I wonder why we don't also talk about Lewis Gordon, okay, because I mean, I know yeah. that Angela Gibson, but I mean, yeah. in some ways, maybe he's a more prominent Fanon scholar. Yeah. I find it difficult to say what ontology or how exactly I would locate Fanon. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's all these turf wars in, in Fanon studies. Ah, yeah. like, they're vicious turf wars, man. Yeah. So, like, Homi Baba is to be relegated, the yeah. team tries to suck out analyze Fanon too much, mm -hmm. uh, this guy does something different, and, I, and I, said, look, I mean those things are important because there are implicit ideological states in terms of how one is using Fanon. Um, I think perhaps the, the person who does blow my mind the most in this respect is exactly Lewis Gordon because he does like a very profound existential philosophical reading of Fanon, so much so that that little book of his, Fanon and the Crisis of European Man, yes. Yes. Like, I read that and I was like, this is different to what I thought Fanon was. And I mean, he he's kind of opens the doors and says, let's let's uh, let's think about a whole series of philosophical categories in terms of how what Fanon does and how to, to in a way rethink it. Um, so I suppose what I want to say is both admitting that there's tacit ideological uses in how one places Fanon, 
you know, so Homi Baba is much uh, criticized by Lewis Gordon and others for making this a Fanon who's more psychiatrist of sorts than he is, um, he's almost like a Lacanian <coughs> theorist rather than he is a proponent of violence or whatever. Those things are useful, but on the other hand, sometimes I think we spend a lot of energy in those fights when it actually takes us away from just looking at Fanon. The, 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 the gesture that Lewis Gordon makes so successfully is he kind of, I don't know if you could say this, I don't know if he reinvents Fanon, but he uses Fanon to think with philosophically. Yeah. And, and I think that's the way to do Fanon in some ways, because he himself does. You can't pigeonhole Fanon as um, he's only like uh, allegiant to existential thought, or he's only allegiant to Marxism. He moves across those boundaries as in how he sees fit. And maybe it's slightly idealistic, maybe it's a slightly naive argument. But to, to be able to use Fanon to think about different philosophical categories in, in various different kinds of ways, I, I think is, is, is maybe one way to go. That was the one answer to that question. The, the Biko and Torture thing uh, is difficult. What was the other one? Yes. Biko and Torture? Um, yes, like, because I was referring to torture in, in the context of his death. Right? Yes, yes. And, 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 and one of the misconceptions is that oh, Biko prophesied his death. You know, yeah. and, so that he can become a martyr, which is nonsense. And that's what I'm nourishing in the, in the book okay. with, which I'm working on okay. at the moment. Okay. Uh, because of like, we, we, tell, like, we tend to think of torture in, in terms of you are detained and then we have this police that we put the pliers on you and do a body harm with you. But torture in, in existential terms, like as the everyday, because of like, the life, like, look, the life of oppression, and I wouldn't say apartheid or pre, like, even today, we are still living in a, in a new apartheid uh, condition where black life is meaningless. So I was referring to torture uh, in those terms, or we might say it like, simply in terms of uh, polypharma, structural violence, uh, simply. Yes. I mean, the, the, the bigger question is, is interesting because I agree, I think that is a story that's often told. You know, because that, that last piece that closes, uh, yes. I write what I like. Yes, on death. On death. Yes. Uh, you know, he says things there yes. which sound very much like it. I mean, uh, without contradicting your view, I wouldn't say that he foresaw it, but I mean, I think what seems to me crucial about, and let's take a slightly different way of putting it, if I try and teach some of this South African history outside of South Africa, okay, you know, to like a whole lot of English students or whatever. I think what I battle with, and indeed I battle with it within myself as well, because I haven't been subject to that position, is I think that what was crucial is maybe he didn't foresee his death, but he, he knew it was that possibility, right? I mean, certainly in that immediate time, there were a whole bunch of black consciousness people who, who were killed. Um, and, and so I think what is so very, very, very difficult to try and articulate, whether to myself or to people who haven't lived there, is that black consciousness and other forms of anti-apartheid activism, if you want to call it that, had to deal with precisely the death was the potential um, price of this activity. And I think that is just something which does not exist in any conceptual universe for, <coughs> for a bunch of kids sitting in whatever, New York or, or, or London or something. They just don't see that. They can't believe it, and I also can't believe it. And I think for me, in a way, that, that is why it's crucial to, to understand or try and grapple with part of what Biko is talking about in death. That volume on Biko lives makes a, a really good point about this. Yes. I forget who, if it's Frank Wilderstein, it, he talks it, about it. It's Frank Wilderstein. Okay. Biko in the problematic presence. Yes, okay. Yes, yes. Isn't him also who has this example of a whole bunch of um, I can't even remember if it's black consciousness guys or ANC guys or whatever. They do a march. It's yes, yes. It's show or, yeah, and, yeah, and, and Ronnie Castles is there. Yes, is this true? Am I getting it right? Yeah, yeah. And there's, I don't know what you think of the argument. I'm not sure I buy it. But at some point, the Castles is saying, you've got to stop now. They're going to shoot us. Yes. And the way to saying we must carry on. Yes. And he kind of makes the point, and I'm, I'm doing this from memory, so I may get it wrong. The author makes the point that that's why even Ronnie Castles in that moment wasn't, he didn't, he didn't get it, right? He wasn't living the same level of oppression mm. where death meant something different. Mm. And, and so I, I don't know how to articulate, but that not just an awareness, but the, the politics of death or, or, and of course that's, and I suppose also why it's called Wretched of the Earth, although yes. our colleague Nigel Gibson wants to call it the damned of the earth, that base level of radical oppression where death is part of your life is I think what's both difficult to, to translate to people from a different context and so crucial to 
some aspects, I think, of what a beaker was about. I mean, there's lots of other questions, but I think we're a little bit over time. But just one, maybe one last comment on that. I think what's also crucial about the critical remarks you're making about whatever white intellectuals doing this kind of work, um, I think one of the things that comes out of Biko is not obviously just the critique of liberalism, but that emanates because there's so often this gesture in, in trendy um, leftist intellectual stuff to pretend one's doing something yeah. maybe salvate, salvationist or something, and one's mm -hmm. going to help the world and change the world. And I've seen this time and time again, wow, well, well, we're going to change the world. And I think Biko's message emanates far broader than that, just to say, don't speak bullshit. You know, and ultimately for me, what it has come to is to to realize that I am not on a political mission. Right? I'm not. If I want to write about Biko, I write a book on Biko. It's not that like I actually now think <coughs> I'm actually sort of black or something, or that that's my my political mission. It's not. You can easily delude yourself into thinking that and use it as a way of publishing your work and problem. You know, you get lots of. Well, you know, whether it's Zizek or whoever, who's got this like sexy leftist thing, mm -hmm. this pretense of doing something. And some people actually do, so I shouldn't, you know, have a thing. But I think you sometime, at some point, need to be a little bit more uh, uh, honest with yourself about that. And for me, if I do a, a project on this book, it's not because I'm going to try and change the world. It's not that I'm going to inform people. I, I'm, in very many ways, exactly the worst sort of person, suited person to do it. And the only justification I can have for it, I suppose, in that respect, without bullshitting that I think I'm going to help everybody or whatever, um, is that I want to know more, right? And, and I think that's a very narrow and quite many, almost a selfish kind of justification for doing the work, but it's some justification. Right? It's slightly more honest than pretending that it's part of a greater project of social change, which I am going to be a, you know, of course I'm a side. I don't know whether that works, but I think it's important to know. Do you want to respond to his point on Biko and women? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but the interesting thing is the book that you, the book that you referred to is a chapter by Oshadi Waman, and uh, she, she writes uh, about people in women. Actually, I actually do want to respond to that because yes. I, I think, I, I think, and again, it's one of those two step moves, right? Because then there's lots of critique, and there's feminist critique. Uh, from a lot of people say this, okay, that obviously there were these issues in, in black consciousness. <sighs> yeah, okay, admit it. And then people say, well, this whole discourse of black man, you are strong, is mm. problematic. But like, I also want to say, actually, in certain times, I mean, it's not like um, Beaker was working with a great big university library with all the time in the world, okay? He had to write stuff, he had to do things. And I, the way I'm reading it, again, which may be problematic, is that there's this vernacular move within black consciousness to be able to take what bits of these things in order to vitalize and radicalize some form of political critique and indeed some vibrant kind of identity. And hey, if at the time there's this overly masculinist thing of black man, it's not absolutely equitable, but it was, did its job at the time. So I know it's very problematic to try and defend this, but on the other hand, you can see maybe why it did work for a little bit. And I would like to think, and my argument I would make, is that within the broader remit of how it could have gone on to develop, and perhaps has, that black consciousness wouldn't be necessarily stymied by being totally patriarchal. That's not to say that it didn't evince certain kind of patriarchal moments, but that the, the broader general moments of black consciousness would not necessarily destined destiny uh, foreclosed that it would be only uh, uh, prominently masculinist or patriarchal. So that would be my attempt to try and say something on that. Okay. And on the note, I'd like to thank you very, very much. Yeah, I think you really give us a lot to think about and to reflect on, and I'm sure the conversation will continue. Uh, colleagues, I'm going to invite you to please eat and have some tea and coffee. And Diana, if you could please help me. In, thank you, Derek. Thank you.